please welcome Andrew Stegall to the stage. So I know Andrew is keen to answer all of your questions. Um, I'm going to start off. I have a couple of my own. Um, I was lucky enough to meet Alex Lawther, who plays Elliot, this summer. And uh, he's such a charming young man. I think the entire audience fell in love with him. Uh, so my first question is, of course, um, how much of you is there in your lead character? Oh, that's a really good question. So. I saw Alex when he was 16 in a play in the West End in London um, by David Hare. Uh, he was the lead boy and I went up to stage door afterwards and he came out of the theatre um, after the show under the protective arm of his mother. Um, and I mentioned the film, it's about a boy, there's a carrot, um, <laughs> it's going to be great. Uh, a number of years then passed before we felt that we were close enough to being financed to, to start auditioning. We auditioned lots of young men and then came back to Alex and he was about to go to shoot X plus Y with Asa Butterfield. Um, so I had to go and see him in his hometown and he was, uh, I took the train out of London and he was sitting at the train station in a blue Mac reading Camus. Um, and I thought, oh, well, this is done. We're here. This is great. Um, and then we, I thought we'd have the finance to shoot and we didn't, we lost the money, so there was a year's delay and that year was a real blessing because it meant that Alex and I got to spend a year reading all the books that I'd read when I was a teenager and him sharing with me the music he loved when he was young and we watched the films together that were partly an inspiration behind this film. Uh, he came to the house in France and we went on holiday there and uh, he began working on his notebook, um, which is the notebook he has in the film, which is full of his character notes and excerpts from his own diaries when he was 15. So there was a sort of convergence of Elliot, Andrew and Alex, and I think, I mean, it was just such a blessing to work with him, really. He has sort of, sort of translucence, he seems to vibrate. And you wouldn't think it matched Juliet, who has such a strong and remarkable face, but I think somehow they do. They both seem to live beneath the skin somehow. Absolutely. Yeah. I can't remember what the question was, but... <laughs> you answered some bit beautifully, okay, cool. so... <laughs> Um, in an interview I read, you described one of your producers, Jamie Whopper, as helping you make the film you didn't realize you were trying to make in the first place. Oh, that's good. So I wanted to know a little bit, a little bit about how the script morphed over the various drafts um, to become the film that we just saw tonight. Oh, I don't know if I have a really concise and interesting answer to that. It's just a sort of slog through the drafts. <laughs> You get notes from people you want money from, and so you you do the notes, and then it turns out they were quite good. Yeah. Um, sometimes you get notes, and you just wait two weeks, and then send them the same script, and they're really happy. Um, <laughs> sometimes they've said things which it's not until after the film's been released that you realize they were right all along, and you wish you could have gone back. I wanted to end the film when Elliot's under the water, like this, okay. looking up. Um, and just cut there, and the financier at the BFI said, as if we, what we, I showed them that cut with this bold um, take on it, and I was kind of crying, and looked back at the financiers, and was like, huh? <laughs> and they were like, what? This is so depressing, I mean, in a film that's already not exactly ecstatic. Um, <laughs> and I said, but he's looking up, he's, he's looking up, it's gonna be okay. And he said, this is the head of the BFI, he said, if I put a dog under water and hold it down, it's going to look up. Um, <laughs> and then there was a, there was a, so one of the inspirations behind the film was an opera by Dvorak called Rusalka, which is the story of the water nymph who is found by the prince when he's out hunting in the forest with a bow and arrow and looking for deer and he finds instead this pool and from out of the depths of the pool looks up this nymph made of water and she sings to the moon to make her human so that she can be corporeal and embraced and kissed. And that theme felt relevant to all of the characters in the film and to indeed all my family. So, and that's the piece of music that Philip codedly shares with his son and which accompanies the last moment of the film. 
What was the question? <laughs> oh yeah, evolution of the script. So, um, in a sort of typically um, unconfident way, I think of a first time filmmaker, I had contrived for a Fellini-like troupe of actors to arrive in the village led by a charismatic theatre director who were going to present a dumb show piece of silhouetted drama based on Rosalka, just in case you hadn't got it. Um, and that was cut because we couldn't, it was the easiest thing to cut um, financially at the end, just to get us to the last, to the green light. As too many extras? Yeah, too many extras, too much narrative, and of course, unnecessary. It was a bit of scaffolding um, that I'd become attached to and perhaps yeah, I needed to take that away. So the script evolves in all sorts of different ways. Yeah. You mentioned, you touched on briefly there, um, some films that you shared with Alex that had impacted mm. this story. So can you share those with us? What are some of those titles? Yeah, okay. Um, Ival by Andrew Cotting, um, based on the Baron in the Tree. It's a really lovely story. Um, I always get this title wrong in French and in English. I think it's The Wild Reads. Roseau Sauvage by Teshine. Um I mean, sometimes these films inspired me just because they were made. I didn't, you know, you wouldn't see traces of them. They weren't, yeah. but I, I was, I needed them. Um, and a film called um, Le Souffle by Damien O'Doul, which is a rather sort of tricky black and white, probably rather indulgent film. You see why I liked it. Um, so those are the ones that were particular that I hadn't, thought that he might have seen, and, um, and there are other recent LGBT films that I'd really enjoyed, like um, uh, North Sea, Texas, I'd really liked, The bit of freshness. Um, yeah, I think those are the main ones. Great. Well, I think it's your turn now, so raise your hand if you have a question right here. So, um, by your description, the Lasorka was integral to your story from the very beginning. Yeah, so I, I was an opera director and I had seen it in Wexford when I was doing another show. Um, and then I actually asked, I worked with Renee Fleming and asked her to sing it um, uh, along with Over the Rainbow. It's quite a camp night. Um, and so that, so Rosalka was sort of resonant as a theme and also Ovid's Metamorphosis, the story of Acteon who's hunting Diana and Diana turns him into the deer that's then hunted by the dogs, that sort of idea of Elliot seeking to lose his innocence and also trying to avoid experience and transformation in the forest. And my kind of GCSE, which is like a sort of 16, 16 year old exams, my sort of GCSE version of Freud in which the forest of the unconscious and the river and reservoir of sexuality and the barrage wall of death all came together as well in this landscape, which uh, the house belongs to a friend. So I was there when I thought of it. Um, and then I was there when I wrote it. Um, and and then, he was kind enough to let you shoot. <laughs> and then there we filmed it, yeah. So, um, so there's sort of a mix of things. And then my own um, little bit of autobiography. Wonderful. Any other questions in the audience? Yes. Could you uh, please tell us about your casting choice for the mall? Mm. So I saw, I met Phoenix over three years. So we kept thinking we'd have the money and then we kept losing it. And so I auditioned groups of actors in Paris. I mean, all sorts. I mean, all, it's, it's so funny. You're trying to create the possibility of chemistry between two people on screen under the peculiar circumstances of having 28 men and women standing around and pointing cameras at them. Um, I think it, so I kept coming back to Phoenix. He struck me as being interesting. I met him in a bar in the Marais in Paris. Uh, he was a drummer mainly, but he'd been in a short film. And we'd arranged to meet because somebody had recommended him. And my French wasn't very good, and it still isn't very good. And I was very, no I didn't want to begin a dialogue with him that was going to end in him realizing what sort of film it was. Um, so I was trying to explain in this rather noisy bar about how far the explicitness would go, which was not very explicit, but I didn't want him to feel tricked into doing something. So it was an awkward, badly expressed conversation, which was, really was reduced to miming in a bar. Um, but he did meet me again, and then again the next year, and then again the next year, and then when we found Alex, I think uh, Phoenix became a very good 
band. So Phoenix lives in his body and Elliot lives in his head. Um, and they, yeah, so I was just very lucky to find them, really. I asked her, I was at a festival in Normandy in, um, in North of France uh, earlier this year, I asked Clermont what he thought of, what he thought. I asked Phoenix what he thought Clermont thought of Elliot. And he said, I think I was in love with him. And I thought that was really oh. nice, because I think Clermont's straight, and he thinks Clermont's straight, but he thinks that for that week, Clermont was in love with Elliot. And I really, yeah, it made me happy. And it's something you discover, you didn't know that, it just um, emerged. Who's next? Any other questions in the audience? How did you get to...